La Lanterna, a spotlight in Italian football, is a podcast that dives into the beautiful game seen from the eyes of two fans from the oldest team in Italy's point of view. My name is Fabrizio Cardone, Canadian and Genovese, together with my friend Matt Killen, an American-born and Genoa fan. Every week, we'll tell you all you need to know about the only team you need to know about, Genoa CFC. Plus, we'll have guests and provide updates from around the magical world of Italian football. This is Fabrizio and my best buddy, Matt. I am here again, once again. How many weeks is it? 54 weeks? Wait, wait, um, wait a minute. That's fucking Are crazy. you okay? I can I can barely see you with all the smoke happening. What's going on? Yeah, that's your fault, man. That's, this is all your fault. <laughs> no, from no. Canada. It's our neighbor's fault. I'm not in Quebec. Remember that. Yeah, but you probably know some Quebecers or something. I don't know. You Canadians are so nice. Maybe you come over there helping them keep the fire. Sorry, sorry about <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. It's getting better though in New York. It was anybody that is not familiar. There's a pretty big smoke haze coming through New York the past few days from some wildfires in Canada. Yesterday was weird. It was like Mars over here. It was like it was orange light coming through the windows and seeing it coming through the trees. It, was, it kind of looked like I had like ski goggles on or something the whole time. It was so bizarre. Let me add to that. Unfortunately, we've gone through quite the drought in Canada overall. Yeah. So obviously that's not helping with respect to wildfire. There is over 300 type of uh, fires happening right now in Canada, where over 160 of them are in Quebec alone. So what's happening is Quebec, with this high pressure that is coming around the Atlantic in the East Coast, mm -hmm. it's an uh, anti-cyclone. So that means it's going from right to left or counterclockwise. And it's uh, bringing all that smoke from uh, Quebec into Ontario and all the way down through Pennsylvania and New York State all the way down to New York City. If I do, you're going to receive it eventually. <laughs> I know, more smoke coming. Anyway. What happened since last we talked? We were at the beginning of the playoffs and the playouts. I guess let's dive quickly into that. The playouts are done. Uh, we had uh, uh, the two-leg uh, playout. Cosenza, king of playouts winning, managed to win over Brescia. It was quite an exciting match, especially the, the second leg. But at the end, Cosenza managed to win. And there was quite some mess happening on, on the fan side from Brescia because it was in Brescia, the second leg. And because of interruptions, because they threw flares on the pit, they uh, had to suspend the match for several minutes to the point that they almost decided to leave. Uh, then they recouped and they finished the match. But at the end, the judges had decided, as we say in Italian, a tavolino, which means like doesn't matter what the, the result was. It's a 3 nothing win for Cosenza due to fault on Brescia's side, even though it was for the fans. But uh, they gave uh, a direct win of 3 nothing to Cosenza. Having said that, Cosenza remains in Serie B. Brescia technically goes down in Serie C. All having said, uh, which is horrible for Brescia because it definitely was not at all from former playoff candidate of last year to relegation this year. So obviously on their side, it's obviously something unexpected and then horrendous when it, when it comes to a, a club's perspective. But we still have to wait the outcome, as, a, as we mentioned uh, uh, one time or two, if I'm not mistaken, about what happens to the City of Chi side with respect to if there are anyone that are able to not enroll or like economically perspective wise if they're able to come up or not so we still have to see that outcome coming out now when it comes to the actual playoffs what have you seen Matt well you know I think uh, first of all kind of a tough way to end the season for Suti Roll and you know this recording I think we all know now that Suti Roll did not advance they were eliminated by Bari in, in that competition Bari. I think it's obviously a really good season for Suti Roll fans they had a potentially amazing kind of storyline to make it all the way up to Serie A. That season comes a little bit short, but again, considering, was this their first ever season in Serie B? They did phenomenally well and were in the playoff places pretty much the entire season, if not, you know, basically basically that period. So I think them not being there is probably the biggest sort of item. And then I think today, worth kind of mentioning, of course, it's Cagliari and Bari, which I think is a pretty fair representation of two teams that have done a good account of themselves and looking to go up to Serie A. The first leg, 
leg, kind of an interesting one. You maybe saw a little bit more of this match than I did, but of course, 1-1 one, one, the final score. First match, first leg played in Cagliari, so now you've got the return leg at the San Nicola in Bari with pretty much all to play for and could be a very interesting thing. One thing that I did gloss over that I know is probably had a lot of people feeling a certain way. So the Bari Suti role, I actually even saw some posts on this Bari advances on away goals. That is not what happened. It's kind of an no, interesting exactly. way that Serie B decides. So I think when you look at all of like the, the first and second level divisions in Europe, Serie B probably rewards, at least is on the upper scale of, of potential positions that could get you promotion. You know, with the way that they have the playoff position sorted out, it helps with the drama. We've talked many times about how this really adds to the season. One thing that they're doing to kind of cope with the fact that there are so many positions available for the playoffs is if there is a tie after two legs, there's no penalties, there's no extra time. It's whichever team finished above the other team goes on. I think a lot of fans kind of felt a little bit anticlimactic, especially with the storyline of Suchi role and the potential drama that could go on there for that season to end the way it did. I kind of agree with that sentiment. But in the end, Bari were rewarded for finishing above Suti Roll. And of course, they had their first leg today against Kyrie. That's correct. And even their journey to come all the way there, I find that uh, Cagliari's uh, journey was a lot better with respect to not only the season, it's a little bit different between the two. Cagliari was similar to us, started very slow, and then it kind of, with the arrival of Ranieri, definitely had its changes. But throughout the, 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 the playoffs itself, it seemed like their wins were way more quote-unquote powerful. Having the win against Venezia, which was another a team that came down from Serie A together with us, and then also with the win against Parma. So these were two great wins, while with Bari, having skipped the first round because they finished third, uh, they only started with the semifinals, as you mentioned, by playing against Sutirol with this uh, kind of win that happened uh, just because, as we say in Italian, per il rotto della cuffia, which means essentially that just because of that position in the leg third compared to Sutiro, which was sixth, I think, or seventh at the end of the season, allowed them because they were both one nothing win for each one on first and second leg, which brings that tie and gives Bari the edge based on that. Now with the finals starting at Cagliari, as you mentioned, with, with this 1-1 against Bari, gives the upper hand to, to Bari because next uh, time around it's going to be in Bari. Uh, so all they need is a tie once again, no matter what that result is. However, whomever wins obviously brings the, ti the title, meaning, yeah, it's also a title because Nexus uh, Cup or whatever it's called from a City Peace perspective, they still get a smaller cup. I noticed uh, that there's like the bigger, taller one is for the for Frosinone. The medium size came to us and then the, they will also do a celebration for the third one which will be at the end of the match uh, at Bari next week. It's still exciting. I think it's quite interesting, disappointing from some certain perspective because we're so used to, I don't know, extra time or penalties and whatnot. So this new type of, new for us anyways, because it's been for now for, I don't, I can't, I don't even know for how many years, but at least maybe 15, 15 years. years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, said it'd be that they had these type of uh, playoffs, oh, right. which yes. I find fantastic anyways, because it's, it keeps it more interesting. Not only said it'd be itself, we've said that throughout, it's quite competitive just because of the nature of, of City B, but because of the playouts and the playoffs, it brings a lot slimmer the spectrum of those teams that don't play for anything towards the end of the season. So you always see, look at Venezia, like a uh, 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 like few matches before were, were almost relegated, and then a few matches after they caught the last spot for the playoffs, and they could have still proceeded, and you never know. Statistics, though, interesting. I saw that on the Lega City B post on Instagram is that most of the third placed are the ones to proceed. The only one, and I, I kind of feel bad to say it, but the only one that arrived eighth and managed to get the third spot was the cyclists. Some dog. Oh, in that case, otherwise you know. it doesn't count exactly. So most of the teams, I, and I'm gonna guess some percentage, but I would say 60, 70 percent of the third place will eventually get the edge through the playoffs. Still interesting and amazing for the fact of these extra matches right after the end of the season. Yeah, I mean, we still I remember pretty well when the playoffs were happening last season. I was actually still in Italy, so I was, I was kind of watching a little bit of, of, of the Pisa Monza matches and seeing what was 
going on there. And it's kind of a bummer. I was my question earlier was whether or not if, if it did stay, if it ends in a draw in Bari if no one scores, it sounds like Bari will, will progress because they finished above Kari, right. which is that I, I do think that's a little bit of a shame. I think if you're going to Serie A, you should win the tie. Like to not win the tie. Yeah, we I had to, different to go conversations. To promotion. I know, I know. I had different conversations with different people. Obviously, everyone has their own opinion. A lot of people are still against the playoffs, which you know it's it's a personal opinion ultimately. But I think that the 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 fate. This is just again only my opinion. I think the placement should favor the setup of the playoffs, and then that's it. Right. Meaning. Two ties should not have the, the higher place team to proceed. I don't, that's the part that I'm not too happy or fond of. We have also another play out also in Serie A. So looking forward to that for the next season, that means that one of the two are not going to be playing in Serie A. So we're not going to be facing them. And that's happening because 31 points, the third last and the fourth last finished at that Serie A ends with the last three to go down. We know who is the extreme last one, which didn't even touch. 20 points with an extreme record of negativity all throughout and that's somebody once again so i'm sorry for who is sympathizers uh, of that rotten team sorry i shouldn't say rotten but they are <laughs> But we'll have also maybe next podcast or the one after we will talk also about their quite challenging and difficult situation, which nobody wants to be in. But at the same time, there's also some fishy things going on with. Anyway, we'll talk about it further on. So we have definitely some Doria and uh, Cremonese that have already been relegated. That's right. Too bad for our secret agent, Palladini, that didn't manage to do his miracles as he always did with us. Obviously see there's two different type of clubs but nevertheless so we have v Verona and Spezia that finished third and fourth last at the same points so there is not a playoff set for Serie A but the new rule from this year onwards is that if for some reason there is a tie then independently from gold or French or whatnot there is going to be a spareggio which means like a tiebreak and it's going to be a one match on neutral field pitch it was going to be in Udine, there was a lot of controversy around that. Udine and it ended up neutral, being... is it? That doesn't feel neutral. Udine seems that's why there was a lot of controversy because it was too close for Verona. Yeah. And ultimately they ended up choosing Reggio Emilia, so for Sassuolo. And okay. that's where they're going to be playing on Sunday. They're oh. going to be playing the, the Spareggio, which is basically only one match. And uh, so the winner is going to come out of that. There is not going to be favoritism because there's no uh, better placement or whatnot. So they're going to do, if, if there is a tie up until the 90 minutes, it's going to go beyond in extra time. And if not, again, it's going to go to penalties. Do you Sorry. think uh, Spezia Verona is kind of like two teams that I feel like Genoano don't get on with very well. Verona have their, well, Verona just are kind of weird, I guess. I don't know how else to say it. It's not the, the Demolaggio that Parma have with Samp. It's its its own thing. I think their fans have their own kind of reputation. I don't want to completely shit talk that Verona, but I think we can. Whatever. It's fine. There's a little bit of animosity there. Spezia, of course, these guys are also sort of weird. So obviously Spezia, same general region as Genoa. They are a Ligurian side. You have to acknowledge that they're kind of on the very outskirts. You want to talk about like a suburb type of a club. I think you could, you know, probably chief among them is Spezia. And there's for some reason, some ultras thing where their ultras absolutely hate Genoano. I don't know why that is or where that came from or something, but it kind of is when they did get promoted a couple of years ago, there was this mini derby that kind of happened when, when Genoa would play Spezia. And, you know, it's more for us to beat the, the fans who think that there's rivalry than anything else. But for you, like, do you care? Who, who do you want to to go down to stay up in this situation that's an interesting uh, opening that you had so the reason why there is hatred quote-unquote hatred because this is a, a very big word anyways but the quote-unquote unfriendliness that there is for genuani towards verona is identical to parma with respect to the gemellaggio that they have with sabdoria well they have one too so i didn't realize that that's weird that's the extent of it ultimately it's just because their fans are friends gemellaggio with sabdoria when it comes to to Spezia, they don't have Gemellaggio. I at first I thought there was some sort of friendship or whatnot, but they there is no friendship 
and no Gemelaggio with either the two Genova teams, yes. even if we want to consider yes. Sampdoria a Genova team, but LOL around that one. But anyways, yeah. Spezia has, in my opinion, I'm looking at from an Italian and Genovese perspective, is has always have had that, uh, well, first of all, they were not, never been a team that has always been predominant or known to Serie A. So most of the Spezzini, which are the citizens of Spezia, have always rooted for the large, bigger teams, Inter, Juventus, Milan, or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Finally, their team, miracle-wise, reached the Serie A, then obviously not being a big city in its bordering with Tuscany. So yeah. the Ligurians feel Spezia is more about Tuscany, while Tuscany obviously doesn't give two hoots about Spezia. But because as you said, they're like the suburb, city, and etc. They always have this complex towards the bigger city of Liguria, which is what we call the Capoluogo di Provincia, which is the capital of the region of Liguria. Not too sure how politically structured it's uh, in the United States, but we have something similar to that also in Canada, where Ontario, which is one of the largest in population province in Canada, the capital of Ontario is Toronto. The capital of British Columbia is Vancouver, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there, that's like a political capital of that governing region. So in Italy, the, every region has a capoluogo di provincia, And for Liguria, that's Genova. That means that all the other different uh, major cities of the different provinces, because a region is composed of several provinces. So the province of Spezia, obviously, is the capital is Spezia. But they always look towards Genova as their bigger, I don't know, sister, bigger, whatever, and always look at them saying, no, you're not the better one. I'm sure you get that also from New York City when you talk about Albany, when you talk about Syracuse and whatnot. No, they look at him saying, well, you're not that cool because you're New York. So there's like this long story short, uh, essentially what I'm trying to say is like this complex towards the bigger city. And this rivalry from Aspezia towards Genoa or Genova in general for the two teams has always been there. And now it's predominant based on the fact that on the same uh, side uh, of the city app. Plus, on top of that, when it comes from our perspective, if you remember last year when we were uh, to, in Serie A, everyone, because at that point there were three teams from Liguria uh, that were in Serie A, uh, the region had uh, given the sponsor, La, La Mia Liguria, to all three teams. But Genoa got relegated, but because of red tape, paperwork, and so on, that sponsor remained on, on, on Sampdoria and Spezia and, and not to Genoa. So I Everybody was laughing at Genoa because of that. And then at the same time, when they expanded that rule that uh, opened to Genova, Genoa, sorry, that essentially got said, you know what, we don't need you as a sponsor. And uh, ultimately, to your or- original question, and I apologize for making it very long, I personally prefer if Spezia went down to and have the sole and best representation of, the, of Liguria in Syria. I kind of look at, I don't know the context as well as you do, but I sort of feel similarly, like they're kind of like a noisy neighbor type rivalry where it's not as maybe as shared the rivalry feeling between the two. Like it would be nice to play them and beat them twice next season. But at the same time, I don't know. I honestly don't care. Even from some Dottie perspective, the fact that there's not a derby, I'm sure for everybody outside says, oh my God, the derby downtown is one of the best ones, if not the best one. Sure, maybe, perhaps. Do I really care? No, I just care of the predominancy and the well-being of Genoa and having a team especially outside of Genova whether that is Savona or Spezia or Imperia which are the other major teams but nothing major with respect to soccer and they're not there who cares right it to me it would be no different than playing against Empoli oh interesting yeah I mean Empoli is kind of in that kind of Tuscany region too Anyways, then Sunday came and what happened? Playoffs for final, actually. Yeah. Second leg finals of playoffs for Serie B, meaning whoever was going to pass, quote unquote pass, was going to go to Serie A. And, and whoever was going to say whoever was going to win, because as we just talked about, if Bari were to go on with the draw, they would win automatically. So, but this was an interesting match. I mean, what a dramatic ending to this game. 
So you rightly pointed out in Serie B, in the promotional levels, and I know we were griping earlier today about the Coppa Italia because that just came out too, and I introduced another thing to talk about. But the top seed gets preference. They they move on. They have if they all they need is a draw and they move on. So we were all kind of begrudgingly accepting that Bari's probably going up to Serie A because they're coming back to San Nicola. All they need is a draw. With that draw, they're up. And lo and behold, for 93 minutes. Oh, wait, that is a double-edged sword. It, Meaning if you play to tie, you, it can bite you in the back. It could. It absolutely could. I mean, and, and we've heard our our, our friend Jeremy from uh, FC Bari Brit on Twitter. If anyone is, is looking for a little English Bari updates, it's a great follow. He's said many a time that it, the big games Bari don't show up at the San Nicola. And for them to come back at the San Nicola, I'm sure he was probably a little bit worried. But the point being is that it turned out Cagliari are through. And in a in a very dramatic ending to the match, Pavoletti scores with the 90th minute plus four. It ends the match 1-0 to Cagliari which puts them 2-1 on aggregate and means that Kyrie are going kind of clean through up to Serie A, so returning right back up with us. I guess they could have also had only one year on their t-shirts, but we were we beat them to that, so it doesn't count. But, okay, let me add something to that. On the first leg, it actually, oh, actually, let me say it differently. It was almost like a copycat of the first half, meaning the difference compared to the first leg and second leg was up until Pavoletti's goal, it was 0-0, right? But the first half, you would see, like the first leg in Cagliari, mm-hmm. I an amazing Cagliari body was always in their own box trying to, to stop them yep. from the beginning of the second half similarly to the first leg body came out basically was the total opposite where Cagliari in the second half is just like containing and trying to stop Bari's incursions. And in this match too, you got at least two woodworks from Bari, if, if I'm not mistaken. Up until, as you said, when Pavoletti came in and he even had a quote, I read his quote, and he said, who is going to think coming in on a 90th minute and even score? But I really believed in it. And he actually did. <laughs> Unbelievable. Ranieri hands down to his quality and so on. We know him for, even in England, they know him right and brings in Pavoletti gives something um I don't know I'm just gonna guess here because I don't really know but a three five four something like it. it's it was like super aggressive yeah essentially yeah. if yeah. you die you're out anyway so why not exaggerate it right and it paid off it worked and to, out. And to yeah. your point Jeremy saying that an in body their biggest fault is not to perform well at home well they didn't perform badly but they lost their points on a ninth or fourth minute whatnot, but in their home turf with over 55,000 people. I mean, it's obviously for the body fans, it's heartbreak. I know there have been a, a numerous, much well talked about, not very well talked about on our podcast because I feel like you and I are maybe a little bit less in this sense, but I think a lot of the chatter in Serie B this season has been perhaps Bari getting some favorable decisions over the course of the season. I'm not sure I can totally co-sign with that because I kind of feel like a season is a season and you can't have luck happen with you every single time but obviously for Bari fans it's heartbreak right now it's a difficult way to end the season after starting so strong and really having the potential uh, to be in one of those automatic promotional places for very much of the season I think it I'm sure if you were to talk to Jeremy right now maybe it's harder for him to have a, a, a clear head on this but after a couple of days go by you have to look at this season as a success I mean there wasn't any sort of any real expectation for Bari to do anything this season and they clearly looked like they absolutely belonged in Serie B and you could have made the case that they deserved to go up. So Okay, fine. The season of Cagliari was definitely different to Genoa, right? So they started with a different manager. It kind of had hiccups. It kind of had problems. They changed manager and that's where the flip happened. Yeah. Obviously, the roster was a little bit different, but, you know, the race of Cagliari was to catch up. And if you remember, we were laughing about it, but Agnieri's point was trying to catch Genoa's at the second spot. Right. We were chuckling about it, but essentially, if his aim was that, not necessarily true, but at the end, didn't he reach the fifth spot? Like, okay, uh, it was at the last grasp second where Parma got the fourth spot and they got the fifth, but ultimately, they succeeded in what he wanted to do, at least to get the playoffs to the point of being able 
able to do something. And then they, they did. Now, adding to what I was trying to say was mm -hmm. in the first leg, they were up one nothing, And in the last dying seconds, that penalty, which right. gave them that loss. So <laughs> yeah. I can say ultimately, sure, at the end, body lost and they didn't go through because personally, in my mind, they played way too conservative in trying to maintain in body. the overall, yes, body yeah. and the overall scheme of things that tie. And I think that's what bit them in the buttocks. And ultimately, that's why that last three seconds before the end of, of the whistle uh, goal by Pavoletti. It's it's kind of like a perfect encapsulation of, of the tie. I think you're right about that, though, because it, it did feel like, I'll be honest, I didn't really watch the return leg of this series. I was kind of in and out in the first leg. In the moments that I watch, Kairou were pretty dominant in that first leg. I think it's a little unfair to say they completely bossed the game in this one, just looking at the statistics. I think Bari, as you mentioned, had two very good chances. In first fact, half, second half, big difference. Very different kind of component. I don't know, man. I mean, we have another uh, fellow Rosso Blue going up with us, I guess. I, I know it was not exactly a major fan friendship there. I did see some nice comments when we did go up from the fair few Castelio. I don't really know what the fuck that means, but I guess that's their thing. Um, <laughs> so I, I have to look it up too, because I'm not necessarily like a Sarde, Sar Sardinian. Sar I know, I actually know how to say it in English, you know, in Italian. Yeah. Sa Sardinolo. No, I don't know how to say it in Italian. Anyways, I'm not a Sardinian. <laughs> <laughs> I know in English. Sardinian. Um, <laughs> But um, but they don't have any affiliation that I know of on either of the two, meaning they're not friends. And, and that's like an ultra thing anyways, right? So they're neither friends nor enemies with either of the two. Um, and what I'm saying two is like the other half that is not worth is worth it of for Genova City. But anyways, they're not friends with somebody. But the body is. In fact, I think there was a Strishone, a banner somewhere like forever friends or something like with that, like that with the Lucerchiati color. So I'm like, oh, come on. No offense to Jeremy from FC Body Brit, as you said. Just because of that, that's why I would have rooted a little bit more towards Cagliari because of that. So it's nothing against Body itself, but it's because of that friendship, the ultras have with the Subdoria. Ultras. Well, there's going to be a whole friend party down in Serie B next season, it seems like, based off of. <laughs> <laughs> I did an amazing post that it was just like to laugh for. So most of, if not all, <laughs> of the friends uh, that uh, that side of Genova has uh, when it comes to ultras, as I was saying, the gemellaggio that we talked a few times yes, about means yep. the super friendship when you go to, 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 to the stadium, essentially, right? But in Serie B, you're going to see next year, so, of course, Sandoria. then you have Bari, of course, Parma again, Spezia, hey! <laughs> Ter <laughs> not that they're super friends with them, but nevertheless. Uh, Ternana... You do because remember how they treated us when they came and when we really, went down. That, that's really the only fan base in Serie B where I felt like fuck these guys. Like the rest, there were like enough kind of like all right, whatever. Everybody, even the Parma fans, I feel like Parma worldwide, they were all interested. They wanted to hang. They wanted to talk. They were excited to go to Marassi. Uh, but but those guys a little different. And last but not least, the least strong of the all was uh, Modena. So that there's like six teams and just have fun in City B. No offense to City B, mind you, because we enjoyed it and it's a great league altogether. But it's just to say, you guys think the only one that actually remained in City and that we're actually tagged to them, which is a bit on offense, I was going to say. But so before we get into the playouts in City A for relegation, I want to say how awful was that to have 50 minutes apart the two matches? Okay, two different leagues, two different organizations, two different type of marketing, two different type of contracts and whatnot. Why have the two games almost at the same time? I mean, you could have easily made a weekend of it. I, I know there was tradition in, in some periods of think of playing on Sundays, but like it's put a Saturday fixture and a Sunday fixture and, and get it done that way. Even like one starting at six local time, the other one at eight local. Like, you know what I mean? It doesn't have, they don't have to overlap. I'm yeah. just saying, it's just, just like a small it, comment. Make it so that you can actually, no, I think it's, a fair one. I mean, listen, I've watched way more English championship football this year in the past several years, actually, than I ever would normally would have because there would always be this moment where it'd be in between leagues or sometimes they would start with like the quote unquote tea time kickoffs as they call them in Britain. And you have these early games and maybe I don't want to watch, you know, Brighton again or something. And like now you can flip over to the second tier and you're paying attention to what's going on there. And like there's definitely an opportunity for Serie B. We saw how great 
and how competitive the league was. I think the matches were both pretty exciting, at least for sure the Serie B promotion match was. And of course, there was a little bit of, um, you know, I don't know how you want to call Verona in terms of their, obviously they have won Serie A once before, you know, so they're somewhat of a, they're, they're a bigger team for sure in, in Serie A or in, the, in Italian football. But there's enough pull on that game because one of those teams is going down. And that's still a game that is going to have interest. It's not all the time that you have the relegation game happen like uh, that. A play-in game for Serie A, effectively. So one uh, remaining and one leaving, exactly. Right, that doesn't happen. So, you know, to not be able to merchandise that and, and try not to use that overly American term or something, but... So that's a good point that you're making there, Matt. Um, I was talking with Jake from Chita Culture USA. He was saying, his question was, didn't you think that the Serie B playoffs was well more marketed than the playoffs for Serie A? Yeah. Let's uh, say that's absolutely. the only playoff Absolutely, playoffs. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, but I, I think it almost, it, the way that it came out for Serie A, it almost seemed like, because I think part of it was, I'll be honest with I don't actually know, was this because this is the first time, I think they dropped the goal difference rule for staying up, right? So both teams stayed on the same level of points. It's not like the Bundesliga, where if you're in a certain position, you have to play like the third team in Zweite Liga, the second division. So it's not Which is like kind that. of interesting. Like I've never really followed that much at the, the Bundesliga, but that's like bizarre at, on one perspective, but interesting at the same time. It's, like it's you're, wait, Correct me if I'm wrong. The third last of the top league so Bundesliga is going mm -hmm. to play a play out with the third of the second division. That's right. Yep, exactly. Wow. wow. Yeah, so it's a, it's a weird thing because you think you would kind of just reward that other team. If I'm not mistaken, I think the Bundesliga have a few fewer positions maybe than some of the other leagues do. I want to say it's like 18 teams. I can't remember if that's actually true. I think so. But it does add for some drama because it also in recent seasons, I mean, that's kind of the interesting thing lately is you look a lot of second tier football in Europe and mm -hmm. you see some of this in England, I think obviously in, in Italy, and I would say in Germany too, like you have, you know, Hamburg is a team that's been in the second division for many years after like never being relegated until like four years ago. There's one period where they had, you also had Gelson, Kirsten, Schalke and Werder Bremen and all these like really large clubs all playing sort of a second Bundesliga in the Zweite Liga. And so like, you know, in that sense, it's maybe different than a more plucky side, like trying to kind of come out and, and, and get the result, but it's still makes for a really interesting drama and there are a lot of times that those matches are really close too and so it's maybe put, does put the advantage on the club that is still in the Bundesliga, but it, I I think it's fun. And I just, I'm with you too. It, it, it seemed kind of like it was promoted like an accident. Like, yeah, oh, maybe and, most likely to your point, they were not prepared and not being prepared because it was like a new thing from this year. It was almost to the last minute, not really, but sort of last minute. And even that hit the back and forth with respects to, oh, it's going to first be Nudine, then it went to the Gemilia at the Mape Stadium. It was almost like you're not prepared. Odyssey, but I don't know. At that level, I would expect a preparation, even though you're not ready to the levels that, that you're not going to even have any issues. But well, anyways, I think the uh, time I guess though, the time, the time to sell that story was it was the, that's where where they messed up, in my opinion. Like you should be selling that story at the last day of the season okay. when these two sides have the potential to stay up or to go out for what that means and how that plays out. And I don't recall a lot of commotion on that. We kind of knew Cremonese were going. Going down. Obviously, Sam yeah. had been confirmed going down. The last position you've got Spezzi and Verona, who are both, I think they both did have something on the line. And I remember that last match day being kind of an eventual match day in Serie A. We obviously talked about some of the things that had happened there uh, a few weeks ago, but there wasn't really, I, I don't remember a large amount of focus on specifically what that outcome meant for Spezzi and what it meant for Verona. And then it kind of was like, I actually, for a second, without looking at the rules and without us talking about it a week or so ago, I thought like one of the clubs maybe got hit with like a sanction or something like lost points and then now they had to just like play a match because they all of a sudden run this it, it was that hastily seeming advertised like, yeah this is fucking weird like why is this happening so uh, ultimately they ended up their 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 league at a par so there was this new play out uh type of match as you said as we just finished to say badly organized but nevertheless this uh match between spezia and verona now boy like this season from both sides was horrible Horrible, nonetheless, not to mention the fact of issues throughout. Very bad transfer market from a Spezia side. A Verona, good on the paper, but for some reason their season just didn't kick through at all. So they both arrived 
hungry in a way for winning because you know remaining up in city high is one thing relegating sure you get the parachute money or whatever but it's still not that cool not that easy and not that great like look even Brescia right now or I mean that's a different story altogether we didn't really talk about too 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 much about it they're they're fishing out all lawyers throughout trying to catch Regina Regina <laughs> actually by the way their restructuring got accepted so they're officially okay to proceed okay uh, there's still some issues perhaps for one or two teams in Serie C coming up so they might hope on that and or still some Dodi which we're going to talk probably about in the next or what not uh, episode after that let's go back to our Spezia and Verona both at this horrible season both surprisingly in the first year of this play out Serie A thing where if they are at par they're not going to look at the goal differential they're not going to look at the head to head they're going to go straight to playoff one shot one leg neutral a stadium and whoever wins goes it was a clear win for Verona mm -hmm. bye 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 La Spezia 3-1 for Verona also there was a red card for Verona about on the 70th and 80th minute plus a penalty that was missed and they still didn't manage to score then it was it was as you said at the beginning of the season it's, it would be maybe not a complete shock but kind of surprising to see Verona because if I, if I recall correctly like the couple seasons prior they had both been pretty firmly in the mid table if not even like borderline close to like the lower European positions well you're right But that was when Tiago Motta was at Spezia, now at Bologna, while Verona had Juric. Then since Juric passed on to Torino, Torino caught that better momentum closer to the European levels and Verona slowly declined. Most of their players are still there, but that decline has been constantly there. So and the 3-1. So that means we will have Verona next season in Serie A while Spezia relegated down to Serie B. Let me add one more thing. So in the interim of these two matches, the playoffs and the playouts for Serie A, um, we also had ECL, Conference League and Champions League. We had three Italians. We don't really cover all this stuff because it's not necessarily really touching our area. But nevertheless, wanted to say that there That's were three right. Italians, Inter playing against Men City. We had uh, Roma playing against Seville and we had Fiorentina against West Ham. Correct. And unfortunately out of three finals we were hoping at least one italian to win one i think the one that was the closest was the inter at the end inter was pretty close i mean that game they played a really good match i think in the final not right but i think everyone was kind of writing them off at the beginning of that game but you never know and, and they've had some good results they're good kind of playing off of the counter attack too so there were some people that were thinking an upset could happen but yeah i mean it's, i suppose a little bit disappointing i actually thought that all three finals were pretty close the um that's true that's true the uh, fiorentina west ham match was really just this one excellent through ball that ended up proving the decisive goal in that one uh and that was a one nothing that was a one nothing there was a penalty shout of course there were many shouts I I think before, after, during the match from Mourinho's side about Roma not getting cer certain calls or calls going Sevilla's way or whatever it might have been. I still think not enough for me to think that Sevilla didn't deserve to win the Europa or win that match. Yeah. Um, but it was still, to underline that point, it was still obviously a close match in that perspective. And, as and that was 2-1. 2-1, right? Which I, th I think had extra time too, am I not mistaken? Just close enough. It was going to go there and then it just happened just minutes before the, the end of the the regular time that's right yeah Sevilla again by the way just another unbelievable seven trophies in what 10 years or something like that as well just like I mean, it's called Seville Cup now <laughs> yeah the Seville Cup and obviously you know Man City doing Man City things as in football for everyone else I guess there are two good things about this Inter did not win I had one friend we had a meme going around I know that like I, I know what kind of where you sit on this one Fabri towards the beginning of this match I was actually kind of leaning in slightly more City not because of anything I like about City as a team or anything but I just have a, a friend who's a diehard Inter fan and I think I'd just rather him be quiet so I was <laughs> happy that that ended up in that out but the bigger outcome which I did think was going to happen if this happened is that Pep I don't think is coming back and I, I honestly think that team is going to be average 
bridge next year. I don't think they're going to be the same. I really don't think, I don't know who you put in place of him, but you've got every ego in the world on that team. You have two starting 11s that are among the best teams in Europe and they both are on the same team. And you need a guy that has the respect of all of these guys' attention all the time, who, by the way, have just won everything there ever is to win or getting paid millions just to sneeze every day when they wake up. So yeah. you have to have someone that stimulates these guys. And I think if he's gone, then, you know, maybe we don't have to worry so much about it always being like potentially like a Man City PSG final or something like that every other year, which... Well, PSG, we can not worry, not worry too much about it. <laughs> no, we don't really need to care so much about PSG and what's happening there. By the way, Messi also coming to Miami, I think, is relatively recent news. There's all sorts of weird shits going on. Is that official now? Like I heard about it, but is that official now? It's, I don't know if he's actually been bought it in the US? Or, but he's definitely going to Inter Miami. And there's this whole other thing about them signing like possibly like multiple former Barcelona players, which would be insane. I don't know if you saw this thing, but everything's crazy. So apparently Luis Suarez is really strongly linked to join him. He's right now playing Gremio, I think. Or no, he's he's in um, Club de Nacional, I think, in Uruguay. He was at Gremio for a second, unless I'm conf confusing him with, with another guy. But so he's another guy. I, I want to say, I think you were saying Busquets, maybe. <laughs> it's just like all these crazy names that would come down and just play for this MLS team and I guess would roll everybody or something. I don't know. I remember, I still remember seeing Pirlo play for New York City FC and he was like so uninterested. I it know. was like him and David Villa and I love Pirlo. You know, he's this amazing player, but by that stage of his career, it was like, you could tell this guy's like, I, it's not even, I'm not even going to worry about it. So we'll see what that looks like. But anyway, lots of comings and goings and maybe the most exciting so, wait go ahead sorry no i only wanted to open this about these three just to say the the sad part like we had in in my like kings i like the outcome of the playoffs and the playouts uh oh so while you talk about those three finals to say the disappointing fact of the italians not winning well, and right we have to add that to the other final which was under 20 fifa world cup so this was in Argentina. You had an Italian side. People are talking about not too much competition out there, not too many great teams. Also, because you've seen Israel coming up to the semifinals, you've seen other minnows, if I may say, no offense to them, of course, but you know, not, not, but even Brazil was very, very, very bad. The final was Italy versus Uruguay. Now, we raved a little bit about it based on the fact that we had a representation from both sides. So we had Maturo, which is our young defender left back, central and, and left back. He actually won the second best player of the league of the competition, which which is phenomenal. And then we had Lipani, which was is not necessarily always a starting 11, but he's definitely in the under 20 Italian team. The, I don't know how much you watched about that match. So I, I didn't see the actual match, but I, I do think it's, this whole thing is actually very interesting, of course. So yes, Makuro and Lipani, both the guys that played. I think both of them basically, maybe there was one game that Lipani didn't feature in, but most of the time he did. And I think most of the time he did come on, you know, like 60th minute or something thereabouts. So a, a person that was clearly kind of being called upon regularly. We've heard, I remember Mancini having a maybe a quick audible clip or something many months ago about him. I mean, one of the guys that was called up for selection when they were looking at stuff like this. But it's just cool to see Lipani kind of getting his run, being in the side that had a chance to really win something. And you have to say he was contributing to this team. There's no question about that. Lipani, or excuse me, I, Maturo is really interesting because your point, this is a guy, he started just about every game. If you like the sofa score or the fat mob, whatever you go to get your kind of game analysis if you're not happy, able to watch the match itself. I mean, this guy's almost always putting out really good ratings for what he's doing. And I think an interesting thing, obviously, we didn't, I don't think we saw him at all for Genoa. I mean, I know he made the bench. Did he, did he make one appearance? That's right. He did have one. He'd be suited for a lot of games that really didn't play, of course, for us. But like we talked about before, like left back is a position where there's some question marks. He was being deployed really mostly at that role in this tournament. And I'm not sure we're going to now throw, you know, an under 20 year old kid to the fire in, in Serie A, but, you know, maybe he's kind of getting to that place where we can try to get him battle test a little bit and just see how he reacts to playing against people at that speed um, and with that, that know-how. All you need is an opportunity and a good match. Yeah. And that's it. That's it. That's exactly and, it. And in a way, 
I think indirectly that's what was happening to Bocci, but unfortunately then he got injury and unfortunately for him that season was over. Yeah, but I agree with that. Great match. Unfortunately, Italy at the end. Again, similar to the other matches uh, in the dying minutes, there was a red card for Italy and that a minute or two later, I was very predominant on the Uruguay side. It was almost night and day. Almost like if Italy was either quieted or just did not show up for some reason. Yeah. Uh, but the approach of the of the match was uh, quite different, uh, maybe because they were close to home. Uruguay and Argentina are just like neighbors, uh, while Italy, of course, is far away. The stadium was nothing that great. La Paz, no, La, something like I never even heard of that stadium. But at the same time, um, it was, um, it was uh, uh, unfortunately, it was a loss. one nothing for Uruguay. Uruguay, uh, under 20 FIFA World Cup winners. Mm-hmm. Italy, second best, so silver medal. But that was, you know, disappointing in a way but still great achievement for the Azzurrini with our Lipani and that can only make us hope and looking forward for our youth uh, growing more and more and more perhaps we'll have some players that are going to be loaned out we shouldn't be surprised about that because that's very important for their future development and that's when we know when they will explore or not so these kids have to wake up and go wherever that is is it, even if it's in City D or City C just uh, or even some in City B just just remember that this is their spotlight. This is their moment to wake up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, it's just, a, it's exciting when you have like, young players who can make an account for themselves. And hopefully, you know, that that experience gives them a little bit of confidence when we are looking to call them, hopefully in the not too distant future. Speaking of which, that's actually kind of a good segue. So transfer news, this is an older one, but I want to bring it back up. There was one rumor about an Empoli player, I think they're a left back, that potentially could be on Genoa's radar. Have you heard anything about this anything that's progressed on that side we know a whole lot else it's kind of an interesting one with you know how we're going to handle that position because it sort of feels like we've got a lot of players on the books right now on that side but we still maybe need another player it's interesting which role are you talking about uh, left back oh left back I don't know. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I think the market is still not open yet. You know that the uh, philosophy of 777 is do everything behind the scenes and not know too much. So at this point, I would say let's take everything with a grain of salt because most of the rumors are just coming from journalists, especially from the Genoa, Genova side, which are famous for that. They just don't know what to write, so they're just going to invent things. But at the same time, it can be true, but that's just luck of the draw. Uh, When it comes to market, the only things that we really know is obviously, and I want to put that like in the front page is Gilardino has been reconfirmed. And I'm just going to remark here the fact that the journalists were saying, oh my God, they haven't been signed him yet. And so on. Ultimately, uh, in the contract that they had with Gilardino when he got signed, when he got reconfirmed as after he was appointed as the interim coach was if there was a promotion, the the reconfirmation information would have been automatic. So that's a big thing I, uh, when it comes to Genoa. Genoa's perspective, sure, it's a very brand new coach, but that does not mean that he cannot succeed and he cannot do well. We've seen that in the past with Gasperini on, with, uh, under our skin. That's right. Uh, and, and at the same time, even from other coaches. Obviously, that does not mean that he's going to succeed. But from what we have seen in City B, I would say, cautionly, I'm going to say it, but probably the the best coach in Serie B, or at least one of. I think Giardino definitely showed his medal this past season. That there's no question. I mean, it, Serie A will present a different challenge for us, especially depending on who we're able to sign and who we're able to keep. The player I was referring to, by the way, is uh, Fabiano uh, Perisi. So I'm not sure if that's yeah. really on the cards or not. There was some speculation, some rumors. The name wasn't ever actually directly linked with Genoa, but there was some conversation that maybe there could be a player there. And the interest, this player was actually... He's always been linked with bigger clubs like Inter and stuff like that. But there have been some suggestions maybe something could happen. Who knows? We do know Raru Dragushin will be a Genoa player. We know Josep Martinez will be a Genoa player. I think there are some open rumors right now about Kevin Strootman and what's going to happen there. Again, very, who knows, soft rumors about him joining his uh, boyhood club of Sparta Rotterdam. Essentially, he comes off from the books of Marcel. He had 
quite a hefty Sorry? Pay, salary. Yeah. yeah. So he had a quite quite a high salary, and that's the part that is a question mark, at least from speculation perspective. That's why right now, as we stand, he's not saying no, but he hasn't said yes because he's still considering perhaps to go back home. Let's remember that he his dad passed during the the, 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 right. the winter. I totally forgot about that. And he still has tight connections with going back to to Holland. Badell has confirmed that he has renewed for an extra year under the direction of Mr. Giardino. Who else do we know? Oh, uh, Yagello has extended his contract for another two years, so at least until That's 2025. Great. And what else do we know? Nothing else. We know, well, obviously, Crisito is definitely off the books right now <laughs> because it was his last beautiful match against uh, Bari. What a wonderful way to go. And on. that was just like, <laughs> that's probably the best way to go. Yeah, I agree. Even though I don't know if you saw um, uh, Ibrahimovic uh, goodbye, that was quite emotional as well. Well, also Verona fans were involved in that one too. Did you hear that? Did you see that part? So uh, Ibra's uh, goodbye match in Milan, it was Milan-Verona. And I think there were whistles from the Verona fans and he said, quiet Verona fans, this is the thing you've came to see all season. This is better than what you came to watch today, basically. Um, (laughs) They all shut up. Well, Um, you see that, that's the interesting part about Ibrahimovic essentially obviously he got kind of shadowed based on the existence of both Messi and and Cristiano Ronaldo I'm not going to expand too much on talking about those two but in my opinion if it wasn't for their existence he would have definitely been the best player the biggest the biggest in football and then one of the biggest anyway I mean he played in a lot of those obviously kind of famous to get punted from Barcelona by um, by Pep but I mean how many big squads did he play and he basically played everywhere PSG, Milan, Inter, United, like all these places. He's um, cocky, but I still think he's better than the other, those two. He he has a very different, kind of very unique skill set, I think. And also like the physical attributes that are a little bit different than, than what those two have. But So yes, we don't know a whole lot else on the transfer news, but we do know one Griffone, a World Cup champion. It's definitely something interesting to see that we have representations on both sides and the under FIFA under 20. So that's quite interesting. In actually, I'm going to use that to say another interesting thing from the next for the next season will be seeing more and more and more of our youth talent being presented, being utilized. So the uh, Cornero, the the Benedetti, uh, Lipani, as you mentioned, uh, the the Baocci, the you know, we're going to see more and more, and that's exciting. That's fantastic i think it's just like beautiful and italy or in general because obviously it started from italy with respect to the coverage and the fame when it, co- talk, it comes to the, the the youth teams should be a lot more expressed it should be a lot more televised it should be a lot more advertised and let's hope that it will eventually have even more followership well think about it like this how many people have been saying oh italian football is dead they have terrible tv rights all the stadiums are falling apart nobody watches matches but what the fuck's happening this season all right italy under 20 team in the world cup europa conference league who's represented fiorentina the europa league who's represented roma the champions league who's represented inter milan like there is good football happening in Italy. There is good, well-managed teams that have the potential to be successful. I think the national team has had some bad patches and somewhat unlucky, but to your point, there are a lot of really talented young players that are coming up, and there's opportunities, and I think at the end, you know, the future looks like it could be pretty strong for Italian football, so let's hope that, like, this keeps up. Let's hope that we continue to see other investments and and, and see Serie A growing. I think even seeing sides, I know we always kind of besmirk a little bit when you see a side like Salernitana make big investments and sign players like Memo Ochoa for kind of a specific reason. But it's also a little bit of a sign too that Salernitana are able to do that and that you have sides in, in Italy that are that capable. So I am, I'm very excited for the final. I kind of would, it's a tough one for me because I think as a casual World Cup supporter, normally not having the United States be very competitive in the competition. These are both nations that I like to see go very far because I feel like Uruguay is typically fun to watch because they, they every player fights and has 
has this kind of certain energy and attitude. And of course, there's a little bit actually of some history between Italy and Uruguay in terms of, you know, a lot of expats, as we say here in the US and other things happening over there. And then Italy just being one of those, you know, really influential nations in, in our game and in football. So I don't know who I really am rooting for in this one, but. Well, it's still a long way to go with respect to having more talent and more focus on the on the more Italians and more talent itself. It's still a long way to go, but I'm really rooting and hoping for the Euros 2032. I mean, 2032 to be in Italy, which means if that bid wins, it's uh, ultimately it's going to be Italy against Turkey. Uh, that means that the bids are going to bring money uh, with respects to helping out to the different teams in putting cash uh, into uh, their stadiums. We know how it is in Italy. COVID definitely did not help. People have their ra- heads wrapped around the fact of, oh, it's EPL. It's all about EPL, higher quality. Sure, back in the 90s that and the 2000s, actually, that's not how it was. Um, I think right now Italy is an underrated uh, league at this point. La Liga is uh, dropping drastically with respects to quality. I'm not saying that it's bad league because by all means, no, but right. at the same time, I, I think that Italy is just a step below the UK. Sure. Who cares if West Ham won against Fiorentina? That does not mean that the country is better soccer. Just go and see who, what happened at the, at the last uh, confrontation, official confrontation of Italy against, uh, and I'm not talking about a conference league, but uh, of Italy against, I shouldn't say it, but <laughs> nevertheless, anyways, what I'm trying to say is Italy, Serie A is definitely a top league. Uh, has a lot to do to build up to go after uh, the EPL. Right now, the major difference is there's a lot more exposure. And because of that, there's a lot more cash. And because of that, there's a lot more potentiality to 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 purchase in, in the purchase perspective. And that's it. And I think with time, everything can happen. Obviously, it, it takes time to make things happen. Yeah. Well, we could talk about this for hours. I guess for the sake of our listeners, probably I won't ignite this, Matt, this fire today. But we should definitely talk about this more because I think like there will never probably be an investment level that you're seeing in Serie A like you see in the Premier League today. I just think logically it wouldn't make sense for that to be the case with the way that the game is exported and other things. But I do think when you look at the way that other nations and I kind of actually look a little bit more towards the Bundesliga in Germany because you have so many small clubs that are very good at being sustainable, at having really good academies, which is exactly what you're talking about, making sure the youth product is coming in and you see these players move on and it's happening more often now in France as well and other places. And there are ways to have a really competitive side, like a side like Freiburg, I think is a side that more European clubs should look to emulate. This is a really small budget side and traditionally not a massive footballing hotbed in the Southwest part of Germany in the the Black Forest region. They are playing European football next year. They were in, you know, potentially Champions League places at some part during the season and they've gotten there largely because by the way they've sold a lot of their players over the last few years um not not something unlike what we've experienced on on um, our side although i will say it is pretty unlike it in the fact that they're actually well managed versus what we had seen with preziosi but if you've got that infrastructure if you've got that support you don't need billions and billions and billions and billions and some really wealthy owner that doesn't really know what they're doing you need a, a really good infrastructure for supporting the club you need good training facilities you need good scouting network or need a, a good way of enticing players to come in and to give them something that they can get in return and say, this club is going to help me in my career. And if all of those things happen, all of a sudden you might be in pretty good shape. You can make some money selling those players on. Maybe you keep some around. You have some fan, you know, interactions and relationships, maybe tug the heartstrings a little bit of the players. You know, we'll see. I, I think um, I think you're right that hopefully this is the first sign of many that you see more of the youth product really blossoming in, in Italy. And um, obviously we're keenly focused on the Griffin team and what they're doing and thankfully this is a positive season for them too so time will tell now before we wrap i just wanted to ask you a quick question while we're not gonna i don't think we're going to expect to have a transfer market with respect with big names and big booms and big bangs and stuff like that yeah are you expecting anything major from the transfer market we'll talk more about it in the next episodes as well but what do you think yes and no i think i, I would imagine we have i ballpark and thinking around four or five new players coming into this squad. We talked a little bit about Strootman. I, I agree with you. I, I think my gut feeling, and not to put this out into the world or anything, but I kind of feel like Strootman is not going to return. That's a key player in a key position. And assuming that Giordino wants to set up the way he's 
set up for most of the season last year with three defensive midfielders. That's a player that we need. You know, we have Badel locked in. Sturaro is a guy that we can kind of plug in there. Vipani is probably a little too green to expect to play that position all the time. He's an option, but we need a player that probably has a little bit more experience. He be, to take it. Remember, he could be the new Rovella too, right? Right. That's also true. Right. Could have a, a couple of different things. So you never, you never know that it could work out that way. But I, I look at that as potentially something we circle. I think when you look at our forward positions, it does feel like at striker, we're going to probably need someone else. Coda, I think we need to keep. I am not at a uh, person that says, let's sell Massimo Coda. I don't agree with that at all, actually. But I do think we're going to need a different kind of target man, someone ideally that maybe plays well with a Goodmanson type of a player. We might want to look at a right winger. I know Yagello could kind of play that position, but honestly, he's really not a wing type of a player. Um, Aramu is who we would normally slot in in that position. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. And then I think, like I mentioned before, weirdly, I, I think there's a pretty big need at left back. You know, our left back kind of squad right now. So we're, we're we're not bringing back caps. Mimo's gone. We have Payach on the books. We have Sibeli on the books. Both those guys are the wrong side of 30. And have not to be just to say this, they've not they've not fared that well in Serie A in the past. And so I, I do think that's where looking at a player that has a good trajectory, maybe he's younger, has played a little bit in Serie A already, has had that experience, is where I would say like maybe there's some opportunities there. I wonder as well, honestly, even on the right back position, we have Hefty, who I think is going to be really solid. But is there a person behind him who we can kind of play Bendy. regularly? Yeah. Well, Sabelli, yeah, he could be the number two. But then is it Payach is the number two on the left back side? Like maybe, I don't know. So, that would be. It, you know, it, it's a little bit of those things. I think that's probably the, the left back position in particular, probably somewhere in central midfield, which sounds insane because we have so many central midfielders, you know, looking at a, a right winger, at least a right midfielder and a striker. So it's actually like a decent number of players that we need to kind of look at. I don't know if you feel the same. Well, if you talk about four or five, it's, it's like 40% of the squad, right? Yeah. Well, right. And if I these guys are going to be starters. Who knows? I kind of think we would need them to be. And, and so in that case, it is a pretty big upheaval from where we are this past season. But we also it'll, did the same thing. It'll be quite interesting to see what happens in the transfer market. Again, I'm not expecting any big bang, big bang boom. But at the same time, it'll be interesting also just to see the, the journalists having fun with different names and see at the end. Ultimately, let's hope that they're not going to wait until August the 31st because or September 1st, whenever the last day of the Calcio Mercato is because this, the season is going to start sometime in second half of, of August anyways, but nevertheless, so to be prepared. So with the Retiro and so on and be prepared for the start of the season rather than adding a few players right at the end that have not had a chance to 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 get to know not only the tactics but also uh, the other players and play with them throughout uh, the summer the, the latter part of the summer anyways so before the end of the episode i wanted to um uh, unfortunately some talk about something quite sad for the world of soccer at least for the italian perspective i don't know to this morning when i woke up and was reading about the news and hearing about the passing of silvio berlusconi it was saddening for me because what he has done with ac milan from almost bankruptcy to the scudetti to the to the, the champions league to even after that when he sold it and so on and we'll talk about his life personal life his companies and politics but even getting back into soccer and bringing an unknown monza from Serie C all the way to Serie A still staying in Serie A very comfortably so it was shocker for me it was surprising I mean I thought in the times that I had seen him this year that he seemed pretty full of life I guess not to use a euphemism but I wouldn't have thought that he would have passed away maybe it was just something that had ended up happening but I don't know I mean I think I saw a post from Paolo Maldini earlier today that kind of seemed to summarize it a little bit as you said like there's this picture of him with all basically all the trophies that he won at Milan and it, you're looking at it and it's like is that all that he won him while he was there was that all the clubs ever won because you're seeing like like seven Champions Leagues or whatever I don't know the, the exact number but it's just like holy shit and and really you know he was the guy that was at the forefront of that club it may be the heyday of Serie A depending on who you ask in the in the 90s and in that late 80s period and obviously you know the names that went through that club especially in the late 80s early 90s i think were 
absolutely un, unbelievable. It was it, they were in modern football now. I know we mentioned you know Manchester City comes up more regularly, but I think a lot of people think of Real Madrid and Barcelona. I would say Real Madrid. Yeah, Real Madrid probably is like the best of the best. I I tend to think that if you look in the, that period of time, I mean, yes, those clubs were still there. They're still dominant clubs, but I I don't know. Maybe Milan is a bigger club in terms of like this is the best right now. And when you just look at like the especially some of the foreign talent that they had brought on in that period of time, just like getting people from everywhere come into this club. So um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. He, I'm sure there was also contribution to what City A was all about as well. Meaning it's not only the reputation and or the quality of AC Milan what happened in those years, but also that as a consequence, as a mirroring effect into City A because of what Milan was all about. I mean, really, I, I would not be surprised. I mean, I think you you think about that era. Remember, I mean, in the eighties, you have Maradona, you have Inter really pushing them. You know, guys like Mateus come over in a similar period of time from from Germany play for Inter. Like that's kind of a crazy thing. Fiorentina were among one of their best. I don't know if when Socrates was playing for them, if that was like before or during. I think maybe it was during because the eighties era Ber- Berlusconi time. I, I can't remember when Berlusconi time. Excuse me, but anyway, all that to say, like, 86, 86. 86. Okay, that may, yeah, maybe that was at the end of that. That is the end of his time at Fiorentina. I don't, I don't know, but it doesn't really matter. I, I think you see that greatness. You see how it elevated those teams. You looked at the way Inter was playing, Juve certainly, even Fiorentina, especially in the nineties with with Dino Baggio and all the things going on there. Like there's there's a lot of stuff that I think helped Serie A shine brightly, and and Silvio's uh, Seri, uh, AC Milan teams were were a major major part of that entire story. So um, there are some pretty funny memes going around that had to deal more with his personal life and maybe who he's being greeted with and all of those types of things. Uh, out of respect, I'll try to not grim- laugh too much at those. But at no, the end well, of the day, that's part of his personality. It's, like it's a hundred percent. My immediate, I have to. Okay, fine, I'll say it. My very first thought after actually processing this is that he's he's at the the great big coach tour bus full of escorts in the sky somewhere. So he's fine. I think in the end, Silvio is doing Silvio things somewhere, and he's I'm sure having having, time. having fun with his girls up there as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Ero milanista da sempre. Andavo allo stadio con mio papà per tanti anni e quindi avevo il Milan nel cuore, avevo fatto anche del Milan, dei suoi impegni, dei suoi giocatori, un esempio da seguire come combattività, come impegno nel perseguire dei risultati importanti e difficili. All right, so I guess we're at a wrap. It's sort of a short one, but you know, this is uh, probably the new uh, summer model and whatnot. But as we always say, reach out to us on, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, on our socials. Drop us a comment, all the likes that you can, always and, and mostly appreciate it. But never forget, always and forever, Forza Genoa. Listen to La Lanterna, a spotlight on Italian football, a podcast powered by Genuani Siresta. Thank you for listening and see you next week.